This is the Wienermobile, made in 1952 by the Oscar Mayer Company as a marketing gimmick to sell hot dogs. I'm going to take you through the painting of this in gouache and also tell you a little bit about the history of the vehicle. The Henry Ford Museum in Dearborn, Michigan has a big collection of pioneering aircraft, famous cars, and other kinds of road novelties. On the fin. <laughs> no, uh, that's right, that's not, next to the fin. You and would lay down for, on the side yeah, there? Yeah, use it for an armrest sometimes, the fin. Wow. It'd be parked in a garage. Yeah, we had a VW bus like this. I think I want to paint the Wiener Mobile. The question is, what angle? No, we got to see the whole thing from the side view. See that upslope yeah. hot dog. Is there only one of these things? No, I think they have others. They used to drive them all around the country. The original Wienermobile hit the road in 1936 and it proved so popular that the Oscar Mayer company made a whole fleet of them and they've been updating that fleet, driven by hot doggers, or as they call themselves now, Frankfurters. They've recently renamed it the Frankmobile to emphasize the beef Frank. There's also been a Nutmobile made by the Planters Peanut Company and a Bootmobile made by the L.L. Bean Company based on their duck boots. But nothing equals the Wienermobile, the ultimate goofy brand icon. It isn't a food truck, there's no kitchen inside. Its sole purpose is to sear itself on your consciousness. I'm sitting slightly ahead of the vehicle, so that means all of those horizontal lines in the roof area will be going back in perspective. And so will the floorboards. And I'm taking measurements between the wheels and measuring the height of the vehicle and trying to transfer those measurements right onto my sketchbook. So that segment from the front headlight to the back of the front wheel well is about the same as from the back of the front wheel well to the front of the back wheel well. And then I check the height. And using a pencil that's fairly dull and fairly soft like this gives me a fairly fuzzy line. I can erase it if I need to but it'll probably be covered up by the paint. Here's the yellow band. And for colors, I'll need a strong yellow, an orange, a red, and a blue, and a black. <laughs> we owned our key. <laughs> yeah, it's really You're getting a behind the scenes look at how these videos are made. Yeah, yeah we have a whole crew. <laughs> yeah, our team of filmmakers are hard at work. Hard at work. Yeah. Yeah. It's really good. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Hey, thanks for saying hi. Appreciate name, it. Matt. Matt. Good to meet you, Matt. Thank you. Good. Nice saying hi. Always nice when someone recognizes me from the YouTube channel. I think we have a question coming in from Dennis. Go ahead, Dennis. I was wondering uh, when you go into a museum to paint. Do you check in with the uh, uh, the desk? Um, do you have to get a, a special pass uh, to take your easel uh, set in, um, or are you just using your uh, your sketch uh, book in hand? Well, let's see. If you're using drawing materials that you can fit in your pocket and pull out easily and work while standing, you almost don't need to get uh, permission anywhere. But if you're getting out your paints, you have to think about each situation. I try to look at the website to see what kind of ground surface or floor covering they have and how much space there is for people to get around me if I'm going to set up an easel. If it looks like I might be obtrusive or if there's a specific rule against sketching, uh, I will check with them first, usually their media person, to get formal permission. But remember, in some places like this where... They really don't mind people sketching, as long as you're reasonable about it. Uh, but if you ask them permission, they might well say no, uh, just to play it safe. So in this case, we didn't ask permission. I think we just told the lady at the ticket counter, we have a few sketching supplies, and she didn't seem to mind, so we went, we figured we were okay. And we met a lot of the janitorial people because we were sitting next to the door where they got all their supplies, and they loved it. The thing I would just keep in mind is just use common sense. Make sure your painting setup is very neat and very compact if you want to paint in unusual places like restaurants or 
shopping malls or things like that. And also, if you're in a foreign country, be real careful if you're sketching, if you want to sketch something that includes a military installation, uh, a police station, or a power grid, because nowadays uh, those things can be a little bit tricky. But uh, otherwise, you're probably okay. As you can see here, I'm laying in tones for each of the areas of the picture. The wood floor, the red-brown color of the hot dog, and then the cool violetish gray of the ceiling area. I'll paint the light yellow band around the hot dog later, opaquely, which is an option you can do in, in gouache that you couldn't do in watercolor. Once I have these big tones down, I can modify them with textures and smaller details. Uh, I have another question, this time from Randy. Hi James, I love all the different subject matter that you paint, but I'm curious about these small documentary style paintings that you make of your various experiences. And I just wondered, do you ever flip back through your older sketchbooks and sort of relive those experiences from the past? Yes, Randy, I've been recently looking through very old sketchbooks, sometimes 40 years plus old sketchbooks from high school and college and art school and just when I was starting out professionally. In 1985, my wife Jeanette and I were sketching buddies. We, we took our first big trip was to England with a sketchbook and a tape recorder. We didn't bring a camera. We un intentionally brought our sketchbooks only, so we had to record portraits and places and statues and things we saw in museums all in our pencil sketchbooks. So when I reopen those sketchbooks, it brings back memories, not just of sights and vistas, but sounds and tastes and memories and people. After all, what is a sketchbook but a record of what we've lavished our attention on? And what is life itself but the sum total of how we've spent our attention? Now I have to say, too, that I sometimes feel like I want to do paintings outside the sketchbooks on separate panels. Sometimes I have to in order to be part of an exhibition or to have something that's seen in a frame. But there is a beauty to having things bound together in order with the written notes so that you can flip through it and bring back one day one observation after another. The hot dog part of the vehicle is made of fiberglass. It's very smooth. It's lit by a lot of different light sources, as you can tell from all the highlights. But generally, the lightest area is this dome above the driver. So I'll try raising the value of that dome to make it more contrast. I'm counting on this yellow being an opaque enough to cover up the hot dog color. Now this color may be a little bit too orangey, too yellowy, but I can add a little bit of uh, reddish pigment into the wet paint while it's still wet. So I'll lay down this tone across the whole surface of the top of it and then I'll drop in some red. Now as I've mentioned the hot dog is a shiny mirror-like surface or a specular surface. Not only does that mean it picks up highlights but it also reflects the light color of the base the light tan base of the vehicle is that lighter line at the base of the hot dog. Now I can paint the yellow band. It goes around the hot dog, so an opaque yellow mixed to a consistency of heavy cream and following an elliptical shape around the edge. This is an example of where with gouache you can't mess with it too much. You gotta just put down a stroke and leave it. If I want to modify that color that I just put down, I can do it, but I have to wait till it thoroughly dries and then put another layer on top. Now what I need to do is to match the progression of tones that we had on the hot dog here on the yellow band. So it starts light on the top, goes through a darker band, and then has a light reflection of that bun or the base of the vehicle, the lighter value. 
And it's not a white color, it's more of a tan color, the color of white bread. And one thing to keep in mind is there's a cast shadow coming down over that light base. And we're starting to get to the fine lines, like the black line at the base of the windows and some of the light lines in the windows. And in order to paint the white area behind the Oscar Mayer logo, I'll use a long fibered flat brush and that long flexible fiber of synthetic fiber will allow me to just put down a stroke and it'll just sit there without disturbing the two layers that I have underneath it now. So I try to put down the paint in just one clean stroke because if I wet the surface with a stroke and then work it too much it'll lift up one of those two previous layers and I don't want that. Is the red of the Oscar Mayer logo redder than the orange or red orange of the hot dog? Very much so. That's more of an orange. I know we often disagree about red and orange. Yeah. But the, uh, the hot dog itself, I, I see it as orange. And yeah, it I is a deeper, one, richer red. It's in value, it is deeper. Yeah. I mean, deeper. Uh, you know. And the. Um, the tan of the body of the car, lower body of the car, is lighter than the yellow of the band, yellow band. Close, but I think it, yeah, I think it's, uh, if I squint down, it's definitely a higher value. Okay, let's talk about highlights. Highlights are formed when light reflects off of a shiny surface, like the surface of this hot dog. They're not just random white dots, but they rather play an important role in helping us understand the nature of the light source and the nature of the form. So, for example, on a form that's elongated, like the hot dog, the highlights are stretched out. So I can get that effect by putting down a highlight, like a dash, and then dragging it while it's still wet. If we were looking at this scene on a sunny day, we'd see just one main highlight on the convex form. But because there's so many different lights shining on here, we're seeing multiple highlights. Now, the color of a highlight is influenced by both the color of the light source itself and the local color or the surface color of the object. So a bluer light might make a bluer highlight. A warmer orangey light might make an or orangey highlight. But the highlight again, it's not pure white. It's often in this case, the highlight would have a little bit of that orangey color mixed into it. A good place to see the color of the highlights is on the headlight bezel and the curved bumper where in the gentle curves the highlights are larger and some of them have that blue surround color. Now in order to paint the chrome areas I'm going to start by painting the darks of the chrome using gray and black and I'm painting those gray and black dark colors over a white unfinished surface and I left a few little areas of white. Now if you look at the top of the left side of the split screen you can see there's some secondary highlights that I've circled these are bounced light that's bouncing up into the undersurface of the hot dog. Now let's switch to painting the red trim on the logo, starting with the outer border. And I'm using, again, this is now the fourth layer over the background. And so I have to be careful I don't pick up that white. The Oscar Mayer logo has recently undergone a major overhaul to maintain that kind of modernistic and light-hearted flavor. It uses the double story A in the lower case of the font and in the upper case it has a interesting hook on the R and the K. Next up I want to paint the little highlights that cross over the letters and also cross the yellow band and across the letters along the bottom. and along the very upper edge of the hot dog. That makes the whole thing look shinier. And in addition to convex highlights, like on the upper surface of the hot dog, there also are concave highlights. These concave highlights tend to be smaller, very fine little highlights, but they're on the inside surface of a dish or bowl shape. Now there's a lot of detail in that farm equipment that's beyond the Wienermobile, and I'm not gonna be able to put all that in 
I don't really want to anyway, because that's just a background foil detail. But I do want to use this white gel pen to add a few very tiny lines and highlights. There are some vertical lines in the windows, and there also are some diffraction spikes around the highlights. Diffraction spikes are star-shaped lines that pop out from a very bright light source or a highlight. You see them in photography, you see them in optics like in astronomy, but they also happen in our eye because of the diffraction effect of our eyelashes. You can see this if you're driving at night and you tilt your head from side to side while you're looking at bright street lights or headlights in the distance. Notice how the highlights move with me as I move around the vehicle. And here's the view inside the cockpit of the driver. Hey, let's have a word from our sponsor. How do you close the gap between watching YouTube videos and mastering skills? Well, that's what I wanted to solve with my tutorial videos. I have them on portrait painting, flower painting, various media like watercolor gouache and casein and oil. Each one takes you in depth, but it has the rewatchability to go back to and enjoy again and again. In particular, you might enjoy this one, Color and Practice, where I take a little bit of theory, some on-the-spot painting exercises, and studio exercises that you can do in your own practice to get better at the skills you want to master. So check out all of my videos. I have links in the description where you can find out more information. One of the last things I want to capture is that sheen on the floor just behind the front wheel. I think we have time for one more question. Go ahead, Tom. Hey, I'm curious if James Gurney was gonna have a cool iconic vehicle to cruise the country with uh, doing paintings and whatnot, what would the James Gurney mobile look like? Hmm, well, Tom, I'd probably model it after Goldsworthy Gurney's steam carriage from 1829. He was an ancestor of mine and an inventor. But I have to say that the Wienermobile would be a close second for ideal vehicles to sketch from. Frankly, I'd relish the chance. If you want to binge watch a bunch of gouache videos, try this playlist here. Here's another related video. And don't forget to subscribe to my channel. And if you want to see merch and other stuff, check out my website.